Oh, it takes this is kind of like class, you know, the teacher stands at the front and everybody gets really quiet. <laughs> Susie's standing here telling me to use the microphone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the August, July, I'm sorry, July. <laughs> exactly. The Archives um, Speaker Series July program. This evening, we're having um, Doug Koppel talk about Barney Ford. Um, we gotta have some housekeeping items to take care of first. Please take a moment, silence your cell phones. Restrooms are back towards the elevator in the back. And if you haven't signed in, please take a moment at the end of the program and sign in. We have people watching online also. And for questions and answers, the question session, it'll be at the end. And the ones watching online, if you'll post a raise your hand on your screen, there's a little button to push to raise your hand. And then also here, we'll take questions here also at the end. Okay. What a nice crowd. Very cool. Very cool. So Barney L. Ford and the American Dream from Enslavement by Doug Couple. Couple will explore the facts and fiction surrounding the life of Barney Ford an escaped slave turned wealthy entrepreneur and self civil rights pioneer in the Mountain West. In 1870, Ford opened the modest Ford's Hotel, which grew to become the Inter-Ocean Hotel, the finest in Cheyenne. Ford also operated wildly successful hotels, restaurants, and mining ventures in Denver and Breckenridge, where he used his wealth and influence to promote education for former slaves and universal suffrage in Colorado. Doug Couple is a, a longtime adjunct, adjunct fa uh, facil faculty instructor, say that five times real fast, <laughs> who has taught in higher education since 1996. He received his PhD from Arizona University in history and has a master's degree in history from the University of Arizona. He also has a master's degree in educational leadership from Northern Arizona University. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Oregon in Eugene. Doug also has a degree in archeology span from the University of South Carolina and is a registered professional archeologist. He spent his career in water resources, first at the city of Phoenix in the city attorney's office and later for the city manager's office. After retiring from Phoenix, he worked for the city of Glendale, Arizona, where he finished his government career as the Deputy Director of the Water Services Department. Today, he's active in the environmental consulting field for the private sector. He is currently the Senior Historian and Archaeologist for the Urbana Preservation and Planning in San Diego. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug and let him do his talk. Ready? Okay. Well. That's quite an introduction there, Robin. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. And just uh, just one thing. It's a pupil like a pupil. So I always have to tell my students that it's kind of a, a difficult name to pronounce. And, you know, different parts of the family uh, pronounce it uh, differently. So, but anyway, it's a pupil like a pupil. So, uh, uh, very happy to be here uh, today uh, with you and uh, really grateful to the folks at the Wyoming State Archives for the help that they uh, provided. And uh, really a great idea to have this and get the project to a, a larger audience. So as long as I'm thanking people, also I thank the folks at the Barney Ford Museum in Breckenridge, uh, Larissa O'Neill and her staff, uh, extremely helpful. And we also had a, a wide variety of other folks. Uh, I'm not going to go through everyone, but uh, I do thank everybody who helped work on this. So uh, with that, I think uh, it sounds like uh, everything's coming through pretty clearly. I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. So let's do that. And here we go. So.
So uh, everybody should see uh, uh, Barney Ford's uh, picture is staring at him uh, from the past there. So uh, the name of this uh, presentation is uh, Barney L. Ford and the American Dream uh, from Enslavement to a Pioneering Entrepreneur. So uh, he really has a, a remarkable a story and uh, a very fortunate to uh, have uh, have the privilege to uh, work on that. So let me get going here. So again, here's here's my picture and contact information. Uh, I do work for Urbana Preservation Planning. They're in uh, San Diego is the main office, but they have offices all across uh, the country, really. And uh, my office is in the Prescott, Arizona. So uh, that's where my base of operations is. But uh, you can send me an email or give me a call, and of course I'll get back to you. So uh, we were tasked with doing this project from the National Park Service under contract to them. And the job was to prepare a preliminary context statement about Barney Ford and then a uh, reconnaissance uh, resources survey. So those are the two uh, parts of it. And uh, we completed that earlier this year in 2022. And, uh, you know, uh, I know a lot about Barney Ford, but I'm sure some folks in the audience probably don't know who Barney Ford was. So I thought it'd be best to uh, give a little uh, a summary of who he was at the start here. And he was born an enslaved person in 1822. So uh, really another uh, kind of curious thing, we are here at the 100th, or 200th rather, anniversary of his birth. So also he shares that birth year with the Harriet Tubman. She's also a 200 year anniversary of her birth this year. So a very interesting coincidence is there. And Ford successfully sought and achieved a freedom in 1848. So he really declared himself free and achieved it. And he uh, subsequently became an Underground Railroad operative in Chicago. That's uh, where he ended up. And then he was a family man. Uh, his wife, Julia Lyons, they had three children. And uh, he did get caught up in the California gold rush. And he did go as far as Nicaragua. This is what they called the inter-ocean route. So if people were trekking across the country, they uh, took a boat and then trekked across uh, Nicaragua to get to the Pacific Ocean. And of course, you have to realize that, uh, you know, trekking across the nation uh, uh, as a, an African-American person was dangerous because uh, they weren't free people at the time. So they could easily be impressed in slavery. So uh, that's why he went that route. Uh, he had a very interesting time in Nicaragua, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but he came back to the United States and then back to Chicago and then uh, got the gold fever again, uh, this time with the uh, Pikes Peak Gold Rush. And so he moved west from Chicago in 1860 to seek his fortune, and he did achieve it. He became a very successful business person, uh, influential in community and state development in both Colorado and Wyoming, uh, while continuing to confront uh, racial barriers. Uh, so really a very significant individual. And he did remain a civil rights activist until his death in 1902. So that's just to, to give you a little bit of background about uh, Barney Ford, and we'll go through uh, most of those uh, points uh, as we move through the project here. And uh, the deliverables on the project, one is a report. It's a uh, historic context study. So that's a report with that title for uh, American Dream from Enslavement to Pioneering Entrepreneur. And then the other a big part of it was a, a comprehensive resource survey. Now this is a desktop inventory, but because of course, 
uh, we're not traveling to all these places, but we inventoried uh, property locations known to be associated with Barney Ford uh, throughout the United States and Central America uh, with the extent the current uh, uh, remaining properties highlighted. So uh, that's the idea is to sort of identify the remaining properties that were associated with Ford. And then we compiled a list of uh, photographs of people and locations associated with Barney Ford, and you'll see some of those tonight. And then we also worked uh, closely with experts and Barney Ford scholars. And uh, I mentioned uh, the archives, uh, Wyoming archives and the Barney Ford Museum, but a number of other uh, prestigious uh, scholars. And I'm happy to see in the uh, the list of participants that tonight uh, some of those are scholars and we are very grateful to them also and uh, one other deliverable it wasn't required by the contract but uh, we thought it would be a great way to present the information about Barney Ford is an ARC GIS a story map and uh, if you haven't used that uh, that technique in that program it's really a, an excellent one and so uh, the link is there and uh, I don't know, uh, I think there's probably some way people put those uh, links in the chat here. Let's see, nah, I can't do it there, but maybe uh, some of the folks at the archive can put that link in the chat. Okay, well, you know, our biggest uh, challenge in the project and really we didn't know that this was going to be the biggest uh, challenge was separating fact from fiction now you know we thought our task was to do the research and write the story of barney ford and uh, that would be it but uh, some other folks had beaten us to it because they had written the story of barney ford unfortunately uh, the story was essentially a historic a fiction historical fiction uh, essentially was made up so there were uh, some a few facts there based on a uh, an accurate uh, biography of uh, Barney Ford uh, from uh, about 1890 and also uh, a little bit later uh, upon his death so there were uh, people that knew the correct history but that didn't stop some other folks from writing some books that were not accurate and the first of these is uh, by Forbes of uh, Park Hill who was a uh, really almost a pulp of fiction sort of writer uh, based in Colorado of course uh, the Barney Ford story was well known in Colorado so he wrote the book uh, 1963 and then 1969 there was a children's book uh, written by Inez Hunt which really used a lot of the information from Park Hill and unfortunately repeated the incorrect information and uh, you can see from the photograph there of <laughs> these uh, uh, enslaved uh, children uh, frolicking around down on the plantation there uh, some liberties were taken with the facts on these books uh, a couple more uh, in 1973 there's a really an update of the original book this is by marion talmage and iris gilmore really essentially uh, the same book that parko wrote uh, with some different facts so they changed a lot of the stories in there that park hill had written so now you had two sets of stories you had to figure out well which was correct and the answer was neither uh, they were both made up so a very difficult and then uh, here's a recent example. Uh, this is again is a children's book because uh, Barney Ford is such an inspirational uh, person. Uh, the schools in Colorado uh, uh, utilize his story as a motivational, uh, inspirational uh, educational material for uh, young people, and appropriately so. But it just gets repeated and repeated and repeated, and if it's repeated enough times. Uh, people accepted this fact and just sort of say, well, wow, that's not really true, uh, a big challenge. So uh, that's the woe is me part of the story, not that you care about that too much, but uh, just for the background of it. So here, 
uh, the uh, early life of uh, Barney Ford. Uh, he was born an enslaved person in 1822 in Stafford County, Virginia. And that's really the heart of the Virginia slave country, uh, quite close to the nation's capital. In fact, uh, one of the quarries uh, in Stafford County supplied the stone for the capital. He did relocate to South Carolina as a child, uh, most likely uh, with his uh, family. We don't know anything about his family except his mother. And his mother did go to South Carolina and uh, she was alive as of 1870. So there's probably some more room for research in South Carolina about uh, his mother. Now, uh, in 1839, he was acquired by a slaveholder in Georgia and uh, began working, driving hogs to market, working on cotton barges and river boats. And he may have even been a miner in the Georgia gold rush. So that's uh, a possibility. Uh, we do know he worked in Kentucky between 1839 and 1843, the ages of 17 through 21. And then after that, again, worked on cotton barges, making deliveries between Georgia and Florida. And uh, in that time period, he became enslaved by Nathaniel Woods. And uh, this is the only enslaver we know the name of. And uh, we know that because uh, Barney Ford wrote a letter uh, declaring his uh, freedom from slavery. So in 1848, at age 26, he reaches Quincy, uh, Illinois, and that's a picture of Main Street, Quincy, about that time, uh, declared his uh, liberty, uh, wrote a letter to his uh, enslaver uh, telling him that he was declaring himself free. And uh, a couple of years later, the uh, person who enslaved him, Nathaniel Woods, actually did uh, free him in his will. So they were knowledgeable of each other and in touch. So uh, uh, at that point, uh, Barney Ford is a free man. So uh, he uh, moves from Quincy up to Chicago and, and realized that, uh, you know, Illinois was, we think of it as a free state, but certainly the southern portion of Illinois, a uh, closely associated with slave states, so it is still uh, dangerous uh, for a person who could theoretically be caught and uh, enslaved again. Uh, Chicago a little bit different because of the uh, government of politics there, uh, really an area of protection based on a local government. So uh, he arrives in Chicago, Barney Ford does, he works for the Underground Railroad leader Henry Wagoner in Wagner's livery stable that see him there. He learns the bar, uh, barber's trade, as many African-American men uh, did. So he learned that trade and became involved with the Underground Railroad. And it's here in Chicago that he uh, meets and marries uh, Julia Lyons in 1849. And that's uh, her picture, probably about the time of their marriage. Uh, she's Wagner's sister-in-law because her sister is married to uh, Henry Wagner, the uh, Underground Railroad leader. And uh, soon after, uh, a first child, a daughter, Frances, is born in uh, June of 1851. So, uh, you know, we're talking about this like it was just yesterday, but you think that's a long time ago. And it's here where uh, Ford, Barney Ford, makes his, uh, his sojourn to Nicaragua. Of course, 1850, 1851, uh, people are very well aware of the gold rush in California. Uh, Barney Ford, uh, very likely to be uh, uh, knowledgeable about mining through his uh, time in Georgia. So he decides to go to California. He takes that inter-ocean route, travels to New York and uh, down to uh, Nicaragua. Uh, really, and as we said before, to avoid traveling through areas of enslavement, there might have been quicker ways to California, but not as safe. But once he gets to Nicaragua, he decides to stay there. There's lucrative opportunities there as a hotel keeper, as a restaurateur. And he establishes a hotel, the United States Hotel in the Greytown. 
uh, it wasn't lasting too long, however. Uh, Nicaragua at that time was uh, an independent country, but it was under the uh, auspices of Great Britain. And so Great Britain was collecting taxes there. There's a taxation dispute and the people aren't paying taxes and so they want to collect. So the U.S. Navy gets sent in down there and there's a skirmish and the town gets burned down, the entire town. And of course, this includes the United States Hotel. So it's destroyed. So after that, he begins to work for Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, the famous uh, railroad man, as a steward on a Lake Nicaragua steamer. And so, you know, even though he didn't go to California, there was certainly plenty of the people who are still continuing to travel there. Uh, and then he opens another hotel, the California Hotel at the Virgin Bay. In just a minute, I'm going to show you a map of these locations. I know it's a lot of words on the slide there, but I'll show you a map of them at uh, Virgin Bay. So again, he's a hotel keeper, but it's at this time when uh, William Walker, the filibusterer who wants to uh, really take over Nicaragua, create a slaveholding colony down there, sort of a expanding manifest destiny to Central America. And so when Walker invades in Nicaragua and wants to establish a slave colony, Barney Ford decides that it's time to leave, and he does. So he goes back to uh, Chicago. So here is a, a, a drawing, an engraving from 1854 showing the attack on Greytown, the burning of the ship here and the uh, town. And uh, you can see they've drawn some buildings in here. One of these is the Lions Hotel. And so uh, thanks for that link. I see that's going up in the uh, chat there to the uh, storyboard. But you see the Lions Hotel there. And although that name is the same as the maiden name of Barney Ford's wife, uh, we don't think there's any relation. We think that's most likely a coincidental. But it kind of gives you a good picture of what maybe Barney Ford's hotel looked like in Great Town uh, before the uh, destruction. So here's that map I promised. This is the Atlantic Ocean here, uh, Pacific Ocean on this side. And uh, down here, a little hard to see, <laughs> is uh, Great Town. And so Great Town is down here. This is called the Mosquito Coast. And there was a you know, a, a kingdom there, the Mos uh, Mosquito Kingdom that Britain was protecting because they were extracting taxes from all these travelers. So anyway, that's where Greytown was on the Atlantic side. And uh, there's a, a little road here. You can see it. And it's going down here to the San Juan River. And that San Juan River is flowing into Lake Nicaragua. And so once uh, they got a Lake Nicaragua, then they can uh, take a boat across it very easily. And so that's where a Ford was a steward on uh, the Vanderbilt's uh, ships across the lake there. And then eventually he gets enough money, he opens his uh, another hotel in uh, Virgin Bay, which is right here. And you see another uh, road here, the proposed canals uh, going across to the Pacific Ocean where people would take the... Uh, another ship up to California. So that's a little lay of the land around Nicaragua during the time of Barney Ford. And uh, just uh, if you do have questions, you can uh, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. And they're going to be uh, sort of taking notes on that. We'll answer questions at the end here. So if you uh, one comes, you go ahead and uh, kind of record it there. So uh, Ford is back in Chicago. So he was joining his uh, brother-in-law again, Henry Wagner, resuming his work on the Underground Railroad. I realized this is some, you know, 1856, 1857, you know, we're leading the Civil War here. So a lot going on in Chicago. And the uh, a Quinn uh, a Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church, was central to this work, uh, located in downtown Chicago at Jackson and Buffalo Streets. It's uh, now the location of the Monondoc Building, if, 
if you're familiar with Chicago, and if the, there might be some architectural buffs here, a, a very famous architectural landmark today. But that's where the church was originally. It moved, of course, and still there. He opens a barber shop uh, in Chicago, the Jarvis Building, and uh, the, his wife uh, Julia gave birth to their second child, a, a daughter, Sarah Elizabeth. This is a Sadie. And so uh, here's a photo. This is pre-fire Chicago. Of course, the fire is 1871. So this is early, early. Uh, and really, the, he's in the center of the Chicago, right about there. And here's an advertisement telling about his uh, barber shop. They're advertising hominy. And they're saying, well, these are some of the places it's uh, available. And one of those is at B.L. Ford's barber shop in the Jarvis house. So one thing that made the, the job, uh, I wouldn't say easier, but it was very nice to have all the uh, newspaper advertisements by Barney Ford. He was an advertiser in these newspapers for his businesses. So we did have information from those old newspapers. Well, uh, towards uh, this time, or about 1860 now, uh, Ford becomes interested in that Pikes Peak gold rush, uh, starting about 1858. So, you know, it's a couple of years after the, the first uh, discoveries there. But in the spring of 1860, he travels to Colorado, and really, that's not a big trip from Chicago. Here's Chicago here, like Michigan, and you can see uh, several routes there to get over here to the uh, Rocky Mountains. And uh, this at the time was uh, a Kansas territory. So it was not uh, a state, it wasn't even a territory in 1860. So he's there in the spring, in July, his son, uh, Luis, that's his third uh, child, Louis, uh, four, born in Chicago. So those are the three uh, children. So, uh, and he establishes a barber shop on Blake Street in Chicago. And of course, you, on, not Chicago, I'm sorry, Denver has Chicago on the brain. And uh, Denver, and if you've been to Denver, you certainly know Blake Street, the heart of the downtown historic district even today. And surprisingly, uh, there's a photograph. Now, this is not a photograph, but this is a drawing uh, based on the photograph. And so you do see over here the barber's pole. And then to the side of that is a Ford's barbershop. So there actually is a, a photograph that shows that. It's not that clear. That's why they did the drawing. But yeah, 1860, Denver. And so he has a business there. Uh, he opens a restaurant in 1861 at uh, 1514 Blake Street. So again, this is 15th and Blake uh, in the heart of downtown. Uh, is destroyed. There's a, a large fire in the Denver 1863. The great Denver fire destroys this building. So he takes out a loan, gets a loan, and reconstructs it. Of course, he reconstructs it with a nice uh, brick building, uh, which is a picture here. This is the standing building and it's surviving today from 1863. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It's got a barber shop in the basement, a, a store on the ground floor, a saloon on the second floor, and apartments on the top floor for the Ford family. And uh, quite lucrative. Uh, he pays back the, uh, uh, the loan in just uh, three months. So uh, really a very great businessman. Well, uh, he expands his business to uh, Wyoming. Now, of course, uh, if you know the territory, and I know you do, uh, Cheyenne's not that far from Denver, pretty flat, uh, just up to the north there. And so uh, the big thing that's going on is the railroads coming through, the Transcontinental Railroad. 
So Ford, being a smart businessman that he was, decides, well, I'm going to get started in Cheyenne and Wyoming. So in 1867, which is when the town of Cheyenne was founded, he opens a restaurant at the Ford House in Cheyenne. So he has business interests in both Cheyenne and Denver over the next few years, uh, really gradually becoming a involved in the government and community in Cheyenne. Uh, in 1869 and in 1870, he's listed as a member of the Board of Trustees for the town of Cheyenne. You can see his name there. This is equivalent to city council. Uh, and then his uh, family listed as residents of Cheyenne. There's an 1869 census and then the U.S. census. So uh, a prominent member of the Cheyenne community, prominent businessman in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Well, a prosperous businessman as well. So in 1873, he begins construction on the Inner Ocean Hotel. Now this is in Denver, not too far from his old stomping grounds there at 15th and Blake. So this is a very large edifice. This is a photo from 1890, but the building lasted for 100 years. It was eventually demolished in 1973. So you can see the level of achievement for Barney Ford, uh, a very large hotel, a very large enterprise, and certainly profitable at times. Well, that's not going to be enough, so he's going to, make one in Cheyenne as well. So uh, after 1870, they're pretty much down in Denver, Barney Ford and his family. Uh, but he returns to Cheyenne to open his uh, hotel, Inner Ocean Hotel. You get where the name comes from, right? The Inner Ocean route that he traveled. Now, if you look at this closely, you know that it says 1873 here. And most likely that's when the plans were drawn up because uh, there was an economic downturn in 1873. So it wasn't built then, but completed in 1875 in February. So in Cheyenne, uh, it has the same name as a Denver hotel. So now he has large hotels in both Denver and Cheyenne. Uh, in the mid 1870s and it's said that uh, a president Ulysses S. Grant as he was passing through on a railroad trip uh, arrived there in Cheyenne in the morning and had breakfast at the Inner Ocean Hotel in Cheyenne. Here's some later pictures of the Inner Ocean Hotel in Cheyenne. Uh, this one on this side, 1916, and you can see the date up there, 1873. They added these uh, porticos here as the uh, entrances. And uh, here's 1908, an earlier photo. This was during a uh, country or coast-to-coast -coast, uh, trip, automobile trip. Of course, the automobiles were a, a new contraption in those days, and so they had a race across the country passing through the Cheyenne, a stopping here at the Inner Ocean Hotel in Cheyenne. There's another a president, that's a Teddy Roosevelt, passing through Cheyenne you know, with the Inner Ocean Hotel at the background. That's a 1910. So uh, really, Barney Ford and his uh, accomplishments at, at a very, a very high level. And, uh, you know, when we start talking about evaluating Barney Ford and his uh, uh, contributions, uh, it's, it's not so much that he participated in things, but he was a leader in these things. And so his... Uh, his participation really an example so he's contributing to it he's not just participating so uh marty ford went through a lot of tough times as well you know we've been talking about his great achievements and there were many but uh in those days uh, it was boomer bust 
you had a boom or bust economy and so uh, there was a bus there there was a fire uh, next to the hotel there in cheyenne it damaged the interocean hotel uh, closed it down for a while uh, barney ford could not meet the payments on the mortgage and so uh, the property reverted back to the building contract we took over uh, essentially foreclosed on uh, so ford moved to san francisco uh, where uh, his daughter uh, lived opens a restaurant there of course moves to the california mining town of Bodie in 1879 opens another restaurant so really that was uh, his uh, main line of work hotels and restaurants now of course uh, you he read this uh, newspaper account here uh, from the cheyenne newspaper and when he was taking his leave of cheyenne and uh, really some great words a man of unimpeachable integrity a public spirited enterprising that uh, deserved better success for his merits and so uh, really they're sending the good wishes of the citizens of Cheyenne to accompany him to his new home. So really a very well respected and uh, gentleman of uh, Cheyenne. So we have a question there and uh, uh, we're going to have uh, Susie uh, keep notes of those things and we'll get to them at the end. So a sad thing, but uh, really Barty Ford bounces back we talked about the fire earlier now this business went bankrupt so uh eventually he arrives in the breckenridge colorado which uh, was having a, a boom of its own a silver boom in the 1880s he purchases a small residence at 300 south main street opens a restaurant uh so uh that was his uh, his skill there and his uh, accomplishments uh then obviously that's profitable because he has enough money to open another restaurant in uh, denver so he's commuting back and forth has two restaurants there he continues business activities in both denver and breckenridge and in september of 1882 he constructs this home at 111 washington avenue in breckenridge so this is a uh, an engraving from the time uh, actually 1891 showing his home and really quite a uh, nice home in breckenridge so he continues to stay in breckenridge as an entrepreneur uh, he becomes an investor in the Oro Mine, located in French Gulch, which is nearby Breckenridge. He uh, buys uh, an interest in the mine for a relatively small amount of money and then sells it for a $50,000 profit. So you can imagine, you know, $50,000 of value of that in 1889 was considerable. So at that point, uh, he decides to retire from business, and uh, he and his wife, Julia, move back to uh, Denver and uh, construct a home here on High Street. And you can see, really, this is quite an elaborate home, still standing today uh, in a local historic district in uh, Denver. Well, uh, Death comes to us all eventually, and it came to Julia Ford in 1899. So she's uh, buried at the Riverside Cemetery in uh, Denver. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, Barney Ford passes away uh, in Denver, age of 80. And he's uh, buried with uh, his wife there. And also his son, Louis, is buried in the same plot here so uh quite an accomplished man and uh, he's really uh, rediscovered there during the civil rights era and uh people understand the achievements of african americans in the west uh, they renamed some geographical features in breckenridge to honor Barney Ford. Of course, we mentioned the book, that's 1860, uh, 1963. 
So the year following, they renamed these geographic features, uh, Barney Ford Hill, Ford Gulch. Uh, and then a couple of years later, in uh, 1968, uh, there's an apartment complex, uh, government-funded uh, housing uh, constructed in Denver, dedicated a name for Barney Ford. This is a Barney Ford Heights Apartments. There's a school in uh, Denver uh, dedicated to Barney Ford in 1973. And then in 1976, the Central City Opera House, which is a fundraiser, uh, named uh, various seats in the Opera House for famous individuals. And uh, they name a seat for Barney Ford. And of course, 1976 is the bicentennial year, so there's a lot of interest. Uh, that's when the uh, National Register nomination for his building is completed. But uh, they have the idea of, by Catherine McKinney to have as part of the state's centennial year, the bicentennial year of the United States is centennial of Colorado, to have a, a stained glass window uh, in the uh, Colorado State Capitol building. So it was a tradition there to have these stained glass windows to honor uh, pioneers. And so they uh, do that uh, for Barney Ford, the stained glass windows installed in 1981. So there is a, a, a picture of it. This is uh, uh, Barney Ford in the Colorado State Capitol. Uh, so quite an honor in recognition of his achievements. And uh, finally, uh, we're not getting all of the posthumous honors, but uh, the most significant ones. In, uh, in 2004, the Barney Ford Museum opens in Breckenridge, in Colorado, in uh, the Ford's family home. So this was a, a renovated, uh, improved, and restored, and uh, a dedicated a house museum dedicated to the Ford family. So that's a location that you can visit today. Uh, it's open to the public. So that uh, brings us to the end of the uh, presentation now. And uh, this is an 1891 drawing of Barney Ford. Uh, so we're happy to uh, move to the questions. So uh, I see we have one question here so far. Let me take that one. And if you do have other questions, uh, those of you uh, who are in Cheyenne can certainly tell uh, Robert or Susie your question there. So let's see. I may have missed the question. <laughs> I probably put your hand down or something. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing the question. She's raised her hand. Maybe you'd like to speak. Susie, are you with me there? Yes, my apologies. Um, you should those joining us online you should be able to um uh turn your microphone or your camera on if you're so inclined um jenny i see you still have your hand raised do you still have a question yes i wanted to know what some of the primary sources were up through uh barney ford's time in nicaragua and whether there are any descendants yeah, well, there is a, uh, a biography of uh, Barney Ford uh, written uh, contemporaneous with his life. And so uh, that's by uh, Hall is his name. And so we took that as being the most accurate document. And so... Uh, because that was contemporaneous with Ford and, uh, you know, Hall was an important figure as Ford was and they knew each other that we're certain of. And so the story that's in Hall's uh, centennial history of Colorado uh, is probably accurate because it probably came from Barney Ford himself. 
So he does mention the trips to uh, uh, Nicaragua, the trip to Nicaragua. So that's where the basis of it is. Uh, to go beyond that, uh, really, we didn't have too much other than general information about what was going on in Nicaragua at the time. Uh, so uh, we don't know whether or not he took his uh, family with him to Nicaragua. The presumption is that he did not. Uh, so there's still a lot of uh, things to fill in, and there's probably a lot more research that could be done, even in newspapers in Nicaragua. Since he was known for advertising, there may be advertisements there. We did not uh, find any, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Now, to the second part of your uh, question about any descendants, the answer to that is uh, no, uh, no descendants. Uh, his uh, first daughter uh, died uh, fairly early in San Francisco, uh, leaving uh, no children. His uh, second daughter, uh, Sadie, Sarah, uh, did not have children. She actually married a prominent hotel keeper from a hotel keeping family from Virginia who kept a hotel in Washington, D.C., very similar to her father. And so prominent hotel keeper. Uh, she did not have children of her own, although she was a stepmother to uh, William Wormley was his name, his uh, children. From oh. And then finally, his son, uh, Louis, uh, did not have children. And he uh, died uh, early, uh, as we said. So those are the answers to those questions. Yes, we have a question here. My okay. Question, my question was basically about the the offspring, and was his son entrepreneurial like his father, or did he work with his father? Uh, well, uh, that's sort of a sad tale, and he did work with his father, so I'll start with the good points. <laughs> he was in the hotel business uh, with his father, but as a worker, uh, unfortunately, uh, his son, Louis, uh, was in prison for many years of his life. Now, if you go to uh, the Barney Ford Museum, they've uh, written up a little uh, history of him and his stays in the various prisons in Colorado and Missouri. So uh, kind of a sad tale, but uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, the challenges of being an African-American person at those uh, time periods, uh, even today, uh, difficult, and certainly being the son of a prominent man, uh, difficult. So um, he had a difficult life. The son, Lewis, uh, spent many years in the penitentiaries and then uh, got out uh, shortly after his father died and uh, had an issue with his leg and had the leg amputated and died from that a few months afterwards so but that's a sad story uh the most successful of the three children was uh, uh, sarah sadie who did marry into the uh, family but the warmly family a prominent family in washington dc but uh, no children so yeah, that's kind of a sad story. Any other questions? Any other ones? Do you have any online? I do have a question. In Quincy, Illinois, there what there was a known strong abolitionist um, group. Uh, there are a lot of people there that were abolitionists. They actually have a hand in helping Martin Ford. Uh, get out of Quincy, Illinois, and obtain his freedom, or did he stay with his master, and his master eventually let him go? Uh, it's the former, and not the latter. So we don't know the exact circumstances of his uh, escape to freedom. Uh, there are two different stories in the two different books. So we don't know exactly, but he was uh, familiar with the the roads and the rivers there and at some point uh, decided to uh, escape he does uh, write his uh, former enslaver nathaniel woods a letter and we do have that letter 
and uh, it's very uh, revealing essentially saying uh, uh, look I, I work for you all this time and i, I have nothing to, to show for it uh while you slept in a bed i slept on the floor and uh, you know i worked for you and i made money and i have none so uh, really an eloquent uh, letter and so he says that based on the laws of illinois and that's kind of a, a, a curious point but uh, based on those laws he could declare his freedom which he does so he declares his freedom and it's not too long afterwards that his enslaver nathaniel woods puts in his will that he wills uh, him his freedom so he'll be uh, freed in the will so uh, kind of two ways there uh that he gains his freedom but you're absolutely right quincy a very a significant uh, location on the uh, Underground Railroad. Are you publishing something from the information you presented? Uh, well, not me personally, but uh, the Park Service, the reason they were interested in Barney Ford was to uh, look at the remaining properties and to determine whether or not any of those might be a national historic landmarks so he's that significant of a person. and so when we did the study that was one of the things we were asked to evaluate was whether or not uh, uh, barney ford and properties associated with him were worthy of designation as national historic landmarks and but we said that they were uh, we said he's that level a national level of significance and so there is an interest now on the park service of perhaps uh, declaring uh, uh, properties associated with barney ford most likely the uh, uh, home the barney ford home in breckenridge a national historic landmark so uh, that's going to be the next uh, step and so uh, somebody will be uh, working on that uh, very soon. Go ahead. Sounds like Barney Ford was an educated individual. Where did he get his education? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we don't have a firm answer to that either. But obviously, a very educated. Uh, uh, you know the letters he wrote to the advertisements he published uh, show a high level of education very literate and uh, you know uh, most likely uh, within the uh, church family uh, from other uh, folks in the underground railroad and uh, i haven't told all the barney Ford stories but uh, one of the, the stories was he was associated with uh, combating uh, segregation in Colorado schools. And so, uh, you know, he's a wealthy individual paying large taxes, but he couldn't send his children to Colorado schools because uh, it was segregated. So he actually petitions Congress to change that. One of many people who signed a petition, I should say. Uh, so he was active in the church and active in the uh, tutoring uh, with Henry Wagner. Uh, Henry Wagner also moves out to uh, uh, Denver. And so uh, they're both in Denver. And actually, uh, Barney Ford, after uh, Julius' death, moves in with Henry Wagner. So, uh, yeah, uh, schooling in the home, uh, most likely. Uh, we don't have a definitive answer to that, other than to know he was uh, highly educated and very supportive of education. Do you have a favorite story about Ford? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that, you know, the most famous story about the Barney Ford has to do with the Colorado statehood. And, uh, you know, Colorado was a territory 
And so they're looking at statehood in the 1860s there, 1865. And uh, they had a provision in the statehood bill that uh, suffrage of voting was only going to be allowed to uh, white people. And so Barney Ford, among others, uh, petitioned uh, Congress and Thaddeus Stevens, uh, the great uh, abolitionist senator, representative, and uh, uh, said, look, uh, we're opposed to having this provision in the statehood bill. Now, of course, it's been spun since then that, well, Barney Ford uh, prevented Colorado from becoming a state. Uh, during this time period. Well, of course, uh, there were other reasons for Colorado not becoming a state, but this was when uh, there was the uh, action to impeach uh, President Andrew Johnson, right? So people have said, I'm not naming names, but if uh, Barty Ford and the others were successful, Colorado uh, or unsuccessful, I should say, that Colorado might have been a state and might have uh, voted to impeach Johnson. So uh, that's a story. It's kind of been uh, debunked, uh, but really that's a, a reason why Barney Ford is so prominent today because his association uh, with Colorado statehood, uh, with education, of African America. So we focused here on his business history, but uh, there is uh, another side, which is a civic uh, engagement. Uh, and that's kind of a lesser known side because it's, it's not a documented as well, but some work that's been done recently by some of the folks at the Barney Ford Museum to uncover these petitions has uh, solidified that. But Again, like I say, you know, things were exaggerated, and so his role uh, probably exaggerated. Uh, but he certainly was there, was a signatory to these petitions, and uh, a prominent uh, person because of his uh, his wealth and position in the community. So that's probably my favorite story. That is a good one, and we do have um, Larissa from the Breckenridge um, Community uh, Barney Ford Museum on if anybody has any questions for her. Great. Yeah, Larissa, if you want to uh, maybe uh, say a, a few words or if you have some uh, questions from, uh, I don't know if you have a, a room there in uh, the museum, you've got an audience or how that's working, but feel free to chime in. Uh, um, hi, and uh, thank you. I. I would just like to underscore a lot of what Doug has said that um, the the story of Barney Ford has really come to life in the last year through a lot of this research. And it's been really neat to be a part of unraveling a story that has kind of morphed over time. And, um, you know, I, the thing about Barney Ford that I, I always come back to is just this theme of movement. You know, they, Doug really covered a lot of the highlights, but he was just a man on the move and a man always looking for how he could get to the next place, even with all these moments of um, struggles and, um, and, and, you know, failures and his sometimes in the businesses and, and sorry, he's my kids and just always, you know, continuing to seek that next opportunity. So that's the thing about Barney Ford that resonates with me more than anything else. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Well, it's really amazing because, uh, you know, to be in Nicaragua and to be in Colorado and to have businesses in Cheyenne and Denver and then to leave there and end up in uh, uh, San Francisco and Bodie. So, uh, yeah, it's really quite a, quite the story of emotion. And, you know, we think, wow, you know, in the early days, he was on a horse. It was before you had trains. Yeah. And I would just also like to invite everyone to please come visit us in Breckenridge at the Barney Ford Museum. It is free to visit. Um, we're open almost every day, generally Tuesday through Sunday. And um, it's a really wonderful place to get to experience his, his story with some of our interpreters. So that's my pitch. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, one more question. Yeah. Was Bodhi the ghost town? Is Bodhi a ghost town now? Well, it was, it's a ghost town now, but in those days, it, it yeah. was an active uh, a boomer bust to mining town. Is so we. The, is that on the Nevada California border? Uh, well, it's a little more into uh, California. So, uh, uh, you know, in the near, uh, you know, Highway 395, if you know where that is, it's off that. The Mojave Desert, the Barstow area up in there. So, uh, well, into California. We did find uh, just one reference uh, to him in Bodie, uh, which was a. Uh, uh, registrar, a voters registrar, where he registered to vote in the Bodhi. So, uh, you know, a lot of these things are very tenuous, but uh, it's pretty exciting when you find a little, a little link to him being a Bodhi. So it's pretty remarkable. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, and I did uh, uh, send my little uh, uh, note at the end there. So if anybody needs to uh, get in touch with me, uh, uh, feel free to do that. Be happy to have uh, answering more questions if you have any. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. For um, everybody here and also those online, this, um, this has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our, Susie's pointing at the microphone again, <laughs> <laughs> uploaded to our YouTube channel for you to share with others or tell others about to watch. And then also um, please check out the display case here uh, right outside the door to the left. Um, Susie and the museum found some artifacts from the Interocean Hotel and some documents that they put up there. Um, they're very cool. There's a key and that's kind of cool. And then also um, August 11th is our next program. We're going to talk about bombing Wyoming Operation, I'm going to mess this one up, FUGO, and the first intercontinental missile attacks on the United States, 1944-1945. That, again, is um, August 11th at 7 p.m. here in, this, in the room here. Okay, thank you very much for supporting us. This has been a, a wonderful program, and enjoy seeing all of you and having you all online. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Take care. <laughs>